Hello, I'm Clive Nash. Welcome to Let God Speak. We will be looking at some satanic deceptions that are with us in the world today. We can expect them to be more intense leading up to the return of Jesus. We will be guided by the Bible to prepare us for combating strong delusions of the devil. After all, the Bible is the only sure guide when it comes to spiritual truth. If you have your Bible at hand, get it ready to follow our discussion. Well, on our panel today, we have Harold Harker and Lena Yoon. Good to have you with us, Lena and Harold. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be working with you once more. Yes. But uh, before we begin our discussion, let's take time to invite heaven's blessing. Our loving Father in heaven, we just want to thank you that you've given us the Bible as our sure guide for this life and the life to come. There are many deceptions around about us in the world today, many voices that are calling to us to, to follow here and to follow there. But we pray that we might listen to your voice today. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm. amen. Now, Lena, if, um, if you wanted to detect a fake $5 note, um, what would you need to know? Oh, well, um, I'm not a bank teller, but I would say that I will need to know um, a genuine or real $5 note really well. And I need to be familiar with all the features of um, a true $5 note. And the point that you're most likely leading up to is this. Uh, we need to know truth revealed in the Bible in order for us to see error. Mm, yeah, that, that's a good point, Leo. Um, and, and certainly um, the, the Bible is, is kind of like a, a straight edge, isn't it? Mm. You know, or a, or a plumb bob, I mm -hmm. think is the term used in the Bible to measure things by. And uh, we're going to look at some deceptions of Satan uh, today in our discussion. Um, some of the things we'll be covering are errors such as mysticism, near-death experiences, reincarnation, necromancy and ancestor worship. Uh, these are all lies of Satan, but, but Harold, are these, any, are, the, are these new deceptions? No, Clive, they're all variations of the original lie of Satan. He made that in the Garden of Eden. Let me read how God made us. Genesis 2 and verse 7, And the Lord God turned man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. You know, the King James says a living soul, but here it is, he became a being and a and soul not, not wasn't a, added. Yeah, not obtained a, a, a living soul, but... Correct. A soul. Mm. Now, one error is that our bodies may die, but the soul lives on. That's an error. And let me read the error that the devil said from Genesis 3. And I'm reading verses 1 to 4. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Direct contradiction to God. Eve knew what God had said, but Satan's lie becomes the basis of all the errors that happens about when we die. And by the way, Hollywood is exceptionally good at promoting false ideas about life after death. Mm. Now, now, Lena, just so that we get a, a foundation for understanding what happens when we die, what does the Bible have to say about this? 
Yeah, so let's read uh, the first Corinthians 15, 51. Here he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So death is like a sleep. When a, um, a king died in the Old Testament, and he was described as sleeping, so with his forefathers. And also uh, when Lazarus died, Jesus said that he was going to wake him up uh, out of his sleep. So we can see this in John 11, um, verses from 11 to 13. So here it says, These things said he, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. However, Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of uh, taking of rest in sleep. And also the other example would be when the daughter of Jairus died, and Jesus also said that she was sleeping. Hmm. Okay, so let's uh, look at the first uh, main area that we're going to talk about today, and that's mysticism, Harold. Mm. Uh, what, what is mysticism? Well, it takes various forms, but essentially it's the union of the divine with an individual. And this could involve going into a trance or meditation or w whatever. Here, let me read one definition from a dictionary about mysticism. The doctrine of an immediate spiritual intuition of truths believed to transcend ordinary understanding or of a direct, intimate union of the soul with the divinity through contemplation and love. That's from the Macquarie Concise Dictionary. It sounds all very attractive, doesn't it? <laughs> it can but, be. But, but, but that's the nature of error, isn't it? And that's what the devil does. He makes lies seem great. Yeah. So, so what's the problem with mysticism, Harold? Yeah. Well, I can get spiritual insights direct from God, from the divine. They say, I don't need the Bible. But let me read to you Isaiah 8 and verse 20. Here is an answer. To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So the law of God and the testimony that God gives to us. And so if you throw the Bible out as your guide, you become into the you come into the realm of the subjective. And then you say what I believe is right for me. You know, Buddhism and other Eastern religions are manifestations of mysticism. But uh, there is in it also some forms in Christianity. And uh, Teresa of Avila likened the soul that, absorb is, that absorbs and is saturated with God to a sponge and water. Now, some Christians have even used Paul's statement of no longer I, but Christ who lives in me to substantiate the concept of mysticism. The Bible is clear. The distinction is there, but the devil brings this lie to us. Hmm. Now, back to you, Lena. Um, can you cite any words of Jesus, any advice from Jesus that would uh, counteract the subjectivism of mysticism? Yeah, we can find that in Matthew chapter 7, verses from 21 to 27. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name the many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. 
And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which build his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So we will stand or fall, spiritually speaking, depending on the quality of our foundation. So we're going to choose sand or rock, basically. Okay. So, so what would you say, Lena, to uh, someone who says, oh, uh, I don't want to be bothered with all the tedious details of doctrine, just as long as I, I believe in Jesus? <laughs> Well, there may be a problem there. So you may fall for one of uh, Satan's end time deceptions. So listen to um, uh, Ellen White's quotes in um, Great Controversy, page 520. Um, the position that it is of no consequence um, what men believe is one of Satan's the most um, successful deceptions. Um, he knows that the truth received in the love of it sanctifies the soul of the receiver, and therefore he is constantly seeking to substitute false theories, fables, and another gospel. Okay, thanks for that. And uh, now, now let's uh, move on to another uh, era of Satan, and that is the, we'll talk about near-death experiences. Mm -hmm. um, now some point to these as, as proof that uh, we have an immortal soul that will leave the body at death. The, the late Elizabeth Kubler-Ross uh, was uh, a Swiss-American mm -hmm. psychiatrist, or author, yeah. um, and she was a pioneer of near-death studies. Um, Harold, what kinds of experiences are reported to support this false philosophy? Well, usually it's a, a story of a clinically dead person being revived and reporting, I've seen a light or something like that. It's said to support the idea of the survival of the human spirit that goes beyond death. But again, we've got to come back to Satan's lie from the beginning. He said, you will not surely die. He contradicted God. All errors about what happens when we die stem from that original lie. Mm. Yeah, I think one study that I read about the so-called so near-death experiences um, said that they had studied about 100 different uh, experiences they documented. Yep. And they all had this sort of, you know, seeing this light. The light. Yeah, uh, they all had that in common. Um, but we're talking here, as I say, about clinically dead Correct. Uh, people. Um, yeah, so let's go back to um, uh, the Old Testament. And I'm going to have a look at a passage in 1 Kings chapter 17. And we we'll read verses 21 and 22. First Kings 17, 21 and 22. And now this is a, a story here about Elijah who revives a, a widow's son. It says in verse 21 that Elijah stretched himself out on the child, this dead child, three times and cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. I'm reading from the New King James Version. And it uses the word soul here, which is interesting use of it. And then verse 22, Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came back to him, and he revived. So this is a, you know, it's a wonderful story about restoring this, this little boy to the widow lady. Um, but Lena, it sounds as though the boy had a soul that left him at death, the way it's translated here, doesn't it? Yes. What do you say about that? Yeah, similarly it does, but the word here is used um, nefesh in the Hebrew or original. It appears more than 700 times in the Old Testament. Um, the word immortal is never linked to nefesh. So nefesh refers to the whole person being rather than um, you know, separate um, immortal entity. So in this case, it is better translated as life. So the, the life left the boy. So, for example, um, uh, the translators used in the first Kings 19.4, when Elijah asked the Lord to take away his life, uh, also here, ne Nefesh is used. 
Um, so here, there's also another important truth in this story. Um, the Bible actually uh, is silent or doesn't really say or mention that, um, you know, where the so-called immortal soul was after death. Yeah, thanks for that. And it's a, a good observation that the word nephesh does not were, uh, appear in conjunction with the, the word immortal. Uh, we mentioned about the story of Lazarus earlier. Mm. Um, and I'm going to look at John 11, verses 23 and 24. Now, Jesus said to her, that's to, to Martha, the brother of Lazarus who had died, your brother will rise again. Now, it's interesting that Martha's response is, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Now, it's clear that Lazarus wasn't just clinically dead. He, he was really dead. He sure was. <laughs> He'd been yeah. dead for four days. Um, and Martha knew about the resurrection at the last day, as she calls it. So, so how did, um, Lena, how did Lazarus react when he was brought back to life after being dead for four days? Right. Uh, let's read um, John eleven forty three and 44. First, so 43. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth and bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with, an, with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. So there's no um, reported or recorded reaction of Lazarus here. So he did not say that, oh, it was hot or cold down there. Thank you for, for bringing me back here. Or he did not say that, oh, you know, why did you bring me from paradise to this awful, sinful earth? Or he did not say that, oh, he was in purgatory or heaven or hell. So he was completely silent about what it was like to be dead. Um, so the same would be for all the other resurrection stories in the Bible. So if um, immortal soul had been somewhere in a conscious existence after death, then, uh, you know, what uh, would have um, thought that, you know, some of the Bible scholars or you know, writers would have seen this as a great opportunity mm. to come up with a doctrine, um, but nothing there. So, um, you know, again, you know, uh, Lazarus was not clinically dead. Literally, he had been dead for four days. Yeah, so it's, you, you're right. I think, you know, it would have been a great opportunity, wouldn't it? <laughs> so, all right, you know, here's what happened on the other side of the grave. It would have been the newspaper headlines <laughs> of the day. Yes, yeah. Um, it's interesting, that back in the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, and verse 10, it says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. I, I remember my mum and dad uh, saying that to mm -hmm. me. <laughs> but but and that's good advice. But what about the rest of the verse? It says, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. So if we accept the, the Bible teaching of the unconsciousness mm -hmm. of the dead, and there's no knowledge, no wisdom in the grave. Um, how do we account then for these near-death experiences, Harold? Well, it could be either a natural psychochemical hallucination under extreme conditions, or it is a supernatural, satanic, deceptive experience, or a combination of both of these. Okay. Well, we need to move on. Um, we can't be dogmatic, obviously, about explaining these near-death experiences, but we can be assured of what the Bible says about what happens when we die. And verses such as, the dead know nothing. Um, uh, but let's move on to another deception, and that's uh, reincarnation. Uh, Lena, this is quite a, a common idea in the world today, yes. isn't it? Reincarnation. Yeah. Um, even some famous people believe in uh, reincarnation, just like the American actress um, Shirley MacLaine, who reckons that she has had uh, several past lives before. And reincarnation is the idea that, um, you know, you have lived, um, you know, before a current life. And again, it goes back to the lie in uh, the Garden of Eden. You will not surely die. Mm. Um, so 
um, rather than the erroneous idea of the soul going into purgatory, heaven or hell, uh, the soul transmigrates into uh, another form of life. Normally, uh, another human, but in some pagan religions, it could be a lower form of life. And or the soul may go up a step into a human life, um, like Hindus. Hindus um, believe in the progression of the soul until um, you know, heaven is reached. So basically, it may be like um, spiritual evolution, in a mm. sense. Um, I, I want to have a look at um, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 and 28. Uh, here it makes it very clear that as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. So um, how does this answer the, the era of reincarnation, Harold? Well, you read uh, Jesus died once. Let me read to you what Peter said, and he knew Jesus in his letter, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, he said, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive by the Spirit. And it's the same for us as humans. You read in Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed for man to die once. We don't die and live again in a reincarnated form. We die, and if we're in Christ, then we're resting in the grave until the resurrection at the second coming of Jesus. Mm. Yeah, and any wonder the Bible calls this the blessed hope, isn't it? Amen. You know, the hope of the resurrection. Um, another uh, era is necromancy and ancestor worship. Uh, I want to just uh, look at that just for a moment. Uh, what, what is this all about, Lena? Necromancy and ancestor worship. Yeah, necromancy is uh, about summoning the dead um, to reveal knowledge to the living, often about the future. So necro is a Greek word um, meaning dead, and mentia is the other part of the word meaning divination. So um, it is an era that has been uh, around for nearly millennia. And ancestor worship is um, the idea that um, you know, our dead family members are still part of our family and um, they still can influence our lives, especially their spirits may still influence our lives. Mm. Uh, there's an interesting um, story in the Old Testament. Um, I'm thinking of First Samuel and chapter 28. First Samuel chapter 28 is uh, what we're going to look at now. And uh, in particular, I'm thinking of verse 7, which says, Then Saul said to his servants, Find me a woman who is a media, medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, In fact, there is a woman who is a, a medium at Endor. And I think some translations call her a witch, mm. uh, this witch of Endor. Um, so King Saul um, is there asking, he, he wants to... Um, he's no longer really in hearing from God himself. No. You know, he'd wandered away from God. He, he's, the evil of his life had been so consistent that, that God had forsaken him. Um, and so he asks it to bring up um, Samuel uh, for this spiritual uh, medium. But was it really Samuel uh, that, uh, that was brought up to him, Harold? Absolutely not. It was a satanic delusion. Let me read this from Leviticus in chapter 19, verse 31. Give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. And so God has warned us about that. Let me read another one from Isaiah Eight. We read it before, but I'll start in verse 19. And when they say to you, seek after those who are mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? 
Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? So God has said no. And people might think they're having fun if they start with a necromantic seance or the Ouija board, but they're on the devil's ground. God says, don't have part of it. Don't go there. Mm. Yeah, again, as you say, it's coming back to the original lie that Satan told to Eve in the Garden of Eden, isn't yeah. it? All of these things we've talked about. That come know, from Mysticism, there. near-death experiences, um, necromancy, yep. uh, and, and so on, reincarnation. They, they are all variations on a theme that had its origins in Satan himself, appearing in the form of a, a beautiful serpent, mm-hmm. you know, looking very attractive. The deceiver. Yeah. Um, there's a similarity between necromancy, ancestor worship, and personations or other appearances. Uh, what, what form can these manifestations take, Lena? Um, Satan and his evil angels uh, can impersonate the deceased. So the appearances may be very deceiving. The appearance may be very similar. Uh, even their voice can be very similar mm. as well. Yes. Yeah, and um, you know, I, I remember I was uh, sharing Bible truths with a with a lady, um, and she was convinced that her late husband had come into the house. She'd heard the door open, yeah. went into his room, um, turned on his favourite radio program, and she said, "It must it must be my husband." Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, these sorts of things can be comforting to family members, can't they, Harold? But what must we remember? Well, you've got to remember the Word of God. Unless you're grounded in the Word of God, you can be deceived. Listen to this one from Paul writes in Second Corinthians chapter 11. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ, People was, uh, Paul was talking about real people, but who were deceiving others. And the same principle applies, if I read the next verse, even to Satan. And it says, and no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Mm. Satan is the master of deception. Yeah. And all of this came from him. Mm. Yeah. And, and as we said at the outset, you, you know what a fake is? if you know what the truth Correct. is. Correct. Yeah. You know, Revelation chapter 12, verse 9 tells us that Satan is a deceiver who deceives the whole world. Unless we study the Bible, the only sure guide for this life and the life to come, we can be misled. Friend, won't you resolve to use the Bible as your guide for life and truth? It is my prayer that you will do that now and always. We're glad you joined us today on Let God Speak. Remember, all past programs plus teacher's notes are available on our website, 3abnaustralia.org.au. Email us if you wish on lgs at 3abnaustralia.org.au. Join us again next time. And until then, may God richly bless you. You have been listening to Let God Speak a production of 3ABN Australia Television. To catch up on past programs, please visit 3abnaustralia.org.au. Call us in Australia on 02 4973 3456 or email radio at 3abnaustralia.org.au. We'd love to hear from you.